Okay, this is the reproductive system. Um, today we'll be talking about both the anatomy and physiology of male and female reproductive systems. So to kind of give you an introduction, um, sexual reproduction, of course, produces new individuals. Um, that would be true of any species. Um, in human reproduction, we have gametes, which would be composed of either sperm for male or eggs for female. Um, and again, these products are formed in the testes or ovaries, again, depending on your sex. And fertilization um, produces one cell, which is known as a zygote that contains uh, one set of DNA or one set of chromosomes from each parent. Um, so each gamete will provide one set of chromosomes and those combine together to form um, one single cell known as a zygote. In terms of an overview of the reproductive systems, we have gonads, ducts, glands, and supporting structures, and gynecology is uh, the study of the female reproductive system. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the male reproductive organs and components. So first is the testes. Um, this will serve as a site for sperm formation. Um, in particular, we'll talk about the structures within the testes that will play an important role in this process. Uh, the scrotum is the sac that surrounds the testes and its job is to keep the testes cool. Um, the sperms are going to require two to three degrees lower temperature than our core temperature. So it's important for the um, scrotum to kind of keep the sperm a little bit away from the body so that it can maintain a cool temperature. This is the epididymis and this is where sperm after they've been created will be um, stored for maturation processes and we'll talk about how long that actually um, takes. And here's the ductus deferens, also known as the vas deferens. And this is um, going to carry our sperm um, from storage to where they will eventually be released from the body. Here is a seminal vesicle, and this is going to create a fluid that will be released within the um, semen. And the prostate gland uh, will also play a large role in creating a liquid that will be released within the semen. And of course, the penis will be where the semen is released from. And the urethra um, serves as the tube through which urine can flow. Um, it's a common um, tube for also the semen to exit from. Okay, so let's look at some of these structures in a little bit more detail. Um, first, let's take a look at the scrotum. Again, the scrotum is a sac of loose skin, um, can contains um, fascia and also smooth muscle, which allows the scrotum to be divided into two pouches with a septum. Um, we know that the scrotum will serve as a storage location for um, the testes. And again, its major purpose is to serve as temperature regulator for the testes. Um, sperm survival requires two to three degrees lower than uh, body temperature. And um, there's actually the smooth muscle within the scrotum can elevate the testes if the weather is cold. Um, and that would help to, again, keep the sperm at the appropriate uh, temperature. And it also causes the um, testes to elevate with arousal. And if it's too hot, warmth will reverse this process and this will cause that smooth muscle to be relaxed. Okay, uh, so the testes are a, a pair of oval shaped glands and each is going to be filled with two or three seminiferous tubules and these seminiferous tubules in specific are where the sperm are actually formed. Um, that is a question on the quiz, so make sure you write that down. The seminiferous tub tubules are where sperm is actually formed. Here you can see the septum, um, which will divide the seminiferous tubules. Here you can see a lobule, which is a section of um, 
seminiferous tubules basically. Here is the seminiferous tubule itself, and again, this is where sperm are actually formed. And it will be surrounded by a capsule. Okay, let's have a closer look at the seminiferous tubules themselves. So here we're having a um, look at the cellular level. Um, again, the seminiferous tubules contain uh, two different types of cells. They have sperm forming cells, and they also have Sertoli cells, which are going to serve as supporting cells. And also, there are interstitial uh, cells that are between the tubules, um, kind of located between each of these seminiferous tubule tubules, and they're going to secrete the hormone testosterone. And again, testosterone will help to enhance the spor sperm formation process. Okay, let's have a look at one individual sperm and the components of this structure. And the, the way in which sperm is designed is it's adapted for reaching and fertilizing the egg. Of course, that's its, its real goal. Um, so a couple different components. You have the head of the sperm here, which contains uh, DNA. Again, the male is going to provide half the DNA, and the egg would also provide half of the uh, DNA, and when combined, that um, causes the fertilization process itself. Um, the head also contains an acrosome, and an acrosome is a cap-like structure that covers the sperm's head. Um, the acrosome contains some enzymes that will help to kind of eat through the surface of the egg itself and allow that sperm to actually enter into the egg. Um, I believe acrosome is on the quiz as well, so make sure you know the definition for that. Um, moving on down, the midpiece of the sperm contains many mitochondria, and this is important for um, the formation of ATP um, for energy. So again, um, once a sperm is released, he needs to swim like really, really fast and really hard at like a high intensity in order to have a chance to reach the egg. So it's important for um, the sperm to have the capacity to produce a large amount of energy so that he can try and complete this mission and try and uh, reach the egg. Uh, and then lastly, there's a tail associated with the sperm and that's um, going to allow for some locomotion as the sperm does um, swim up the uterus and towards the fallopian tubes, which we'll get to in a second. In terms of hormonal control of the male physiology, um, kind of have a little flow chart here to kind of go over some of this. So first we have the hypothalamus, which is going to release uh, or secrete gonadotropin releasing hormone. This will stimulate the anterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary will then secrete two additional hormones, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Um, these two hormones we'll talk about also with female reproduction, um, but these two hormones are important in terms of kind of stimulating the cycle. Follicle stimulating hormone causes the Sertoli cells to secrete ABP and inhibin. Um, so this is going to help with the process of uh, spermatogenesis, which is the formation of sperm. Luteinizing hormone is going to stimulate the interstitial cells. And again, the interstitial cells are going to uh, produce testosterone within the testes. So again, as we said, those Sertoli cells are going to produce um, ABP, which is androgen binding protein. Um, and again, this will play an important role for the um, stimulation of spermatogenesis. And those interstitial cells will produce or secrete testosterone, which of course um, is the major male reproductive hormone, and this will um, again, enhance our ability to um, complete spermatogenesis. Okay, spermatogenesis, as um, the name kind of alert, alludes to, um, sperm means sperm. Genesis, we know, means to create. So this would be the creation or formation of sperm. 
This occurs in males after puberty, and the process of sperm creation and maturation takes about 74 days. Um, testes can produce 200 to 300 million sperm per day, um, but only about 1 million of these sperm become actually viable sperm that could survive and actually um, have the capacity to penetrate the egg and, and actually um, cause fertilization to occur. Um, the amount of sperm produced per day kind of works on a, um, a need basis. So it's all about consumption, you could say. Um, so the, the more sperm that's released, the quicker rate you would reproduce. So it's kind of like a supply and demand sort of situation, you could say. Okay, so let's talk about some of the male glands. There are three glands associated with uh, the reproductive system, and these glands are going to create substances that will uh, make up the semen. Of course, we know the semen is made up of sperm, but it also contains um, some fluids from these structures that will play an important role in nutrition and also protection of the sperm itself. Um, please pay attention to the um, what is which vesicles or which structures do what. There's a, a question from this slide on the quiz. Okay, so seminal vesicles secrete 60% of a clear alkaline uh, seminal fluid. Uh, this fluid contains fructose sugar, ATP, and prostaglandins for normal sperm nutrition and function. So again, if you think about the, uh, the job of the sperm is to swim as fast as they can. Um, in order to reach the egg, it would be important for um, them to have some sugars available in order to you know, complete their task. The seminal vesicles also um, secrete some chemicals for coagulation of the sperm as well. Okay, here you can see the prostate. This secretes about 30% of the semen, and this will be a milky, slightly acidic seminal fluid um, that contains an antibiotic to kill off any bacteria. So again, serving kind of as a protector of the sperm itself. And lastly, we have the Cowper's gland, and this will secrete a clear alkaline uh, mucus to buffer and lubricate the urethra. So it allows for um, the semen to exit the urethra um, in a lubricated way so that it doesn't cause, you know, any of the sperms to become ruined or modified as they exit the urethra. Okay. So again, as we have kind of alluded to, the semen is a mixture of sperm and the seminal fluid. So again, um, this is, I'm pretty sure, a question on the quiz. 60% of the semen come from seminal vesicles, 30% from the prostate. It's slightly alkaline and milky in appearance. Again, semen contains nutrients, clotting proteins, and an antibiotic, which will protect those sperm. Typical ejaculation contains 2.5 to 5 mils of volume. Um, again, how much volume is in this uh, depends on, again, kind of a supply and demand or frequency of release, you could say. So more frequent release would cause a smaller volume. A uh, normal sperm count is 50 to 150 million per milliliter, and it, the actions of many sperm are needed in order for one to actually penetrate the egg and cause fertilization. Um, so you can think about it like if you've ever watched like the Tour de France on TV, um, that's kind of how the sperm travel. Like a, it's kind of like a bike race. Like you have this big peloton or this big group of sperm that are going to travel together and they work together as a team. And then at the end of the day, they kind of decide like, okay, you're the chosen one. You're the one that we're trying to help to win essentially. Um, so everybody works together and then one sperm is kind of chosen as the one that would actually enter into the egg. Um, but again, you need all of these um, sperm working together as a team in order to um, reach the egg and then also have those enzymes available to help penetrate the shell of the egg essentially. Um, this is interesting. So if less than if you have less than 20 million 
per milliliter of sperm, um, you're considered sterile. Which is interesting to think because women don't even have even close to 20 million eggs available. Whereas, you know, if men release less than, you know, 60 million sperm in a single ejaculation, they're considered sterile. So this just kind of goes to show how many are actually needed in order to, you know, work together and be able to have the capacity to reach the egg. Okay, so let's move forward and talk about the female reproductive system. Um, females, we have some ovaries, which are going to help to produce the eggs. Um, I guess kind of. I mean, the eggs are actually already produced before, um, before birth. Before a female is born, they already have as many eggs as they're ever going to have. Um, but the ovaries are going to serve as a, as a place for um, the eggs to become more mature. There are uterine tubes that will help to uh, transport the eggs. The uterus is where fetal development occurs if, in fact, um, an egg does become fertilized. Uh, the vagina serves as a birth canal. And then we have external genitalia, which constitutes the vulva, and mammary, mammary glands, which will allow females to produce milk. Okay, so here you can see the ovaries. Um, we do have two of them, so kind of uh, one on each side. Okay, here's the uterine tube, also known as the fallopian tube. We have a pair of these as well, um, one from each ovary. Uterus, again, this is where fetal development would occur. The vagina, which will serve as the birth canal. And the external genitalia. Okay, so let's talk about the ovary itself. Um, again, we have two of these pair of organs, size of unshelled almonds in the upper pelvic region. So they're actually pretty darn small. The ovaries are um, a capsule contained in a capsule of dense connective tissue. This is the main site of oocyte or egg maturation. Um, oocyte and egg can kind of be used interchangeably when we're talking about um, the female um, byproduct, I guess. Um, the ovaries also serve as an endocrine organ, releasing estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. Okay, um, so ovary, ovarian follicles are going to secrete estrogens for the following um, processes. So they're going to secrete estrogen for growth and repair of uterine lining, regulation of monthly menstrual cycle or the monthly female cycle, um, female sex characteristics. So again, you think about like hips um, and breast size and curves, those types of things um, within, with the females. And then also maintenance of bone and muscle. So estrogen actually in females plays a really important role with um, calcium storage within the bones. There's some sort of uh, relationship between those two things. So if you have low estrogen levels, you're at a higher risk to have low bone density because there is a decreased capacity to actually store calcium. Um, so that's one of the reasons why once women reach menopause, it's much more likely for them to develop osteoporosis. Um, so, you know, some doctors would prescribe um, estrogen supplements in order to kind of help to protect these females' bones. Same sort of situation we see with female athletes, particularly younger female athletes. If they um, are not having a menstrual cycle on a regular basis, this usually tells us that they're not producing um, enough, if any, estrogen. And so therefore, they're at a high risk of bone fractures and stress fractures. Um, so like the female athlete triad, if you've ever heard of that before, um, where females have a decreased functioning of the menstrual cycle, um, they are also at a high risk for stress fractures because of this relationship of estrogen and calcium. Um, so back to the ovaries, uh, we have a, a mature follicle or one single egg is selected each month 
and they will be released from the ovary and this will um, be the process of ovulation. Okay, so let's talk about folliculogenesis. Again, follicle tells us, you know, we're talking about eggs. So you can use the word follicle, oocyte, and egg kind of interchangeably. They kind of all mean the same thing. Um, I just like this image because it kind of shows you the process. Don't worry about the oocyte pathways, that stuff in blue and black underneath. Just kind of look at how the images actually change. You don't need to know all the details of the enzymes and that sort of stuff underneath there. So let's talk about some of the details of follicle development or production. Um, like I said, females are born with as many eggs as they'll ever have. And females are born with about 300,000 um, primordial follicles per ovary at birth. Okay, so you have 300,000 per ovary of, um, un, I don't want to say undeveloped, but um, unmature eggs when you're born. So females do not have a capacity to create um, or generate any new eggs. Males, of course, like we just talked about, can produce new sperm every day. Um, females, you're either born with them or unfortunately, if you're not, there's no way for us to be able to create those throughout our lives. Um, so these primordial follicles of, like we just said, we have them when we're born. And once we decide to start developing them, and of course that would start at the onset of puberty, uh, development of a follicle lasts 375 days. So this process is actually very, very lengthy in terms of um, how quickly um, or how long it really takes in order to mature one of these eggs in order for it to eventually then be released um, during ovulation. Ovulation or release of one follicle um, occurs 10 to 13 times per year. Um, these primordial follicles, again, um, we have them all when we're born. They can actually stay dormant in the ovaries for up to like 50 years, which is just insane. Um, so think about it this way. You know, you start, you have the onset of menstruation, the onset of puberty and that sort of things around, you know, 10 to 13 years old, 10 to 14, somewhere in that range, I think is fairly normal. Um, and then female will females will continue to, to menstruate in those types of things, maybe until they're 60 um, or somewhere within, you know, around that time um, when females stop releasing eggs um, that way. So we actually release a cohort of these primordial or the underdeveloped follicles um, every month. And this is insane. Only 400 mature completely over a woman's lifetime. So in reality, a female has 400 opportunities to become pregnant. Um, there are 400 eggs um, that actually become mature and ovulate over a lifetime. So again, um, think about just the, the huge difference in terms of capacity when you compare the male reproductive system with the female. Females get 400 shots, Males are releasing millions of sperm every time um, they release any sperm. So, you know, it, it just kind of shows you how much more delicate, I guess, the female system is in comparison to the males. Um, so how does this develop, development pr uh, process occur? Again, this image kind of shows you that, that system. So we've got these primordial um, cells that are stored. Um, you can see prenatal, postnatal um, so we've got these all stored. Um, a primordial follicle will eventually develop into a primary follicle, which then develops into a secondary follicle, and eventually a graphene follicle. And the graphene follicle um, is kind of the, the most mature egg that we have, and it will eventually rupture from the ovary, and that's what is ovulation. Okay, so this maturation process, as we just talked about in the previous slide, um, occurs within the ovary. And eventually, um, we will have our graphene follicle rupture 
and it's released into this releases the egg into the fallopian tube. So here you can see that um, relationship. So um, as the egg is released into the fallopian tube, that's the opportunity that sperm have in order for um, reproduction or in order for the fertilization process to occur. So that egg has to be in the fallopian tube in order for um, sperm to have the opportunity to meet it and to um, have reproduction occurring. If for some reason you have two eggs released at one given time and you have sperms um, reach both of those given eggs, that would cause twins. Um, that would cause twins that are not identical. So you had two separate eggs, two separate sperm. Um, if they're, again, both uh, fertilized, that would cause um, non-identical twins. If you have a sperm contact the egg and those, you know, create as the um, cell division starts to occur, if in fact this these separate and, and creates two um, two babies, this is where we get identical twins. Okay, so after ovulation, we have this empty follicle that's known as the corpus luteum. Um, the corpus luteum is kind of like the remains of this graphian follicle that we talked about. And this corpus luteum is going to secrete uh, progesterone, which is going to help um, prepare the uterine lining for um, implantation if that would happen, or it pre prepares the uterine lining um, more regularly for our menstrual cycle itself. Um, estrogen are going to work with the uh, progesterone in order for us to prepare the uterine lining. We also have relaxin, which relaxes the uterine muscles and pubic symphysis. Again, this would um, more likely allow sperm to more easily um, move through the uterus and up to the fallopian tubes. And we have inhibin, which is going to decrease the secretion of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Uh, corpus albicans is a white scar tissue left um, after the corpus luteum dies. Okay, so you can see um, corpus albicans or mature corpus luteum up above in this image. Um, corpus albicans, so females should technically have like a little white scar tissue for every time you've ever ovulated. And if, if you were to have, a, like if we were to do an autopsy on a female's ovary um, after they die, we could actually determine how many times they'd been pregnant because the corpus albicans is very, very large um, for each child that you've had. So for example, if you had three large corpus albicans, that would tell us that you'd been pregnant uh, three times or that you'd had three children. Okay, so here you can see that corpus luteum. Let's talk about the uterine or fallopian tubes. Um, these are narrow four inch tubes that extend from the ovary to the uterus. Three different parts or three different um, areas of the, the fallopian tubes that we are concerned with. Okay, here you can see the infundibulum. Um, the infundibulum is an open funnel shaped near the portion near the ovary. I think my arrows are slightly off. Um, these are the fiembre, which are finger-like projections um, that are actually going to help to sweep the egg into the fallopian tubes. Sorry, my arrows are slightly off here. And then the ampulla isthmus is the nar narrowest portion of the fallopian tube, and that'll allow us to um, connect to the uterus itself. Okay, so what are the functions of this fallopian tube? Um, so again, like we said, the fiambre are going to sweep the oocyte or that egg into the tube. Um, we have cilia and peristalsis that are going to help to move that egg along. And again, if in fact sperm do reach the egg, it would occur in the ampulla, and that's where fertilization must occur. So fertilization occurs within 24 hours of ovulation. That's a pretty generalized statement. Um, it could be 12 hours. It could be 27 hours. You know, that can vary slightly. 
The other trick is that sperm can actually live for up to about seven days in the fallopian tube. So it doesn't have to necessarily exactly line up with ovulation, depending on, you know, how... Um, that's my dog. <laughs> Um, so the, the sperm doesn't have to exactly line up with ovulation if the sperm can survive in the fallopian tube for a few days before ovulation can occur. Um, you know, that could also lead to fertilization. Okay, so let's look at the uterus next. Um, again, this is the site of menstruation and also development of the fetus. So if the egg is fertilized, it will be... <laughs> <laughs> it will implant on the uterine wall, and that's where the baby will become developed. The, <laughs> the uterus can be subdivided into the fundus, which here you can see is the superior portion. Then we have a body, which is kind of in the middle, and then the cervix is the most inferior portion. Um, and the cervix is where the baby must travel to reach the vagina in order for the birthing process to occur. Okay, so let's look at the uterine wall layers. Um, there's at least one question on the quiz about the uterine walls, maybe two actually. Um, so we have the endometrium. Endo means within, so this is the innermost layer. This is made up of simple columnar epithelium, and um, we've got connective tissue and also endometrial glands. There are actually two layers within the endometrium itself. We have a functional layer, which is shed during menstruation. So, you know, the, the uh, release of progesterone and estrogen is going to help to build up the endometrial wall. And this endometrial wall is going to develop like a dense capillary network. Um, and also it's going to create what's called a glycocalyx and the glycocalyx is going to be like a, um, carbohydrate rich layer basically. Um, and the blood vessels and the sugars together are going to create a welcoming environment in case the egg does become fertilized. Um, if it wants to implant, um, it's ready to be nurtured and taken care of right away. This is also the reason why females might get like an urge for chocolate or, you know, something sweet. Maybe you like bread. Maybe it's something related to carbohydrates or sugars. That's really a common craving for females. And this is one of the reasons why. The release of those hormones help to stimulate those sensations of, you know, like you get like a an urge for chocolate or an urge for bread or pasta or whatever your particular cravings are. Well, one of those reasons is because we want to build up this endometrial lining um, with those carbohydrates so that, you know, we're ready to um, feed the baby if in fact implantation occurs. This also contributes to bloating sensation as well. So um, as we'll talk about in, in our metabolism lecture coming up this week, Carbohydrates are stored with water. They like to be stored with water. Um, they're very hydrophilic in nature. So as we start to store some carbohydrates on this endometrial lining, this causes us to also store water in this location. And again, that causes us to sometimes feel a little bit bloated because you've got excess water storage in, in this particular area. So that's all sorts of fun facts about the endometrium. The middle layer is known as the myometrium, and this is made of three layers of smooth muscle. Um, the contraction of this smooth muscle um, will give you cramps. So, you know, it's common for females to get cramps at certain times of the month, and that's due to the contractions of this myometrial layer. Um, this myometrial layer becomes really important to us uh, during the birthing process itself. That's going to help to stimulate uh, what we call contractions, but basically, um, the contractions of this layer, which would help to move the baby out. Um, again, think about it like this, you know, if, if you don't use these muscles, how are they going to be prepared to do something like have, you know, child labor, essentially. So their contraction each month helps them, them to maintain, you know, some sort of basic level um, so that they can maintain their strength. So if in fact you do become pregnant, you'll be able to handle the process of birthing. So that's 
that's a pretty awesome, I think, way, um, even though, you know, they do suck when you have them. And then lastly, we've got the perimetrium. Peri means around. Um, this is the outermost layer, it's, and it's made up of connective tissue. Okay. Um, moving on to the vagina, this serves as our passageway for birth, also um, menstrual cycle, and then also intercourse. Um, of course, you can see here that it lies between uh, the urinary bladder and also the uh, digestive system, the rectum as well. So it's kind of the middle passageway here. Okay, let's talk briefly about mammary glands. Um, our mammary glands are modified sweat glands that produce milk or lactation. Um, <laughs> the amount of adipose tissue in these glands just determines the size of the breast. Um, that's to say that uh, women with smaller breasts still have the same capacity to create and secrete milk as compared to women who have larger breasts. So the adipose tissue only determines the size of the breast. It doesn't have anything to do with functionality, uh, fortunately. Um, so also, in addition to these adipose tissue within the breast, we also have milk secreting mammary uh, glands that are alveoli, and they open up to lactiferous ducts um, at the nipple. We have the areola, which is a pigmented area around the nipple as well. And then we have suspensory ligaments, also known as Cooper's ligaments, that suspend the breast uh, from the deep fascia of pectoral muscles. And you, as you can probably imagine, these ligaments become more stressed or stretched out with age. Um, so <laughs> this would create, <laughs> this would allow the breast to um, sag down as you become older, I guess would be the only way bluntly to say that. So these ligaments can become stretched out over time. Okay, let's talk about the physiology of milk uh, production and the physiology within the breast. Um, there is a question on the quiz about one of these hormones or one of these in relation to what it does with milk synthesis. So make sure you write these down. So estrogens are going to help to develop the duct system within the breasts. Again, um, as we said, the more estrogen that you have, probably the better duct system that you would have the capacity to create. Uh, progesterone is going to help to develop the milk secreting glands, which we call alveoli. Prolactin will stimulate milk synthesis in the alveoli. And oxytocin will stimulate milk ejection from the alveoli. And this is going to operate on a positive feedback loop that will be stimulated after um, child childbirth process has occurred. Right. So again, prolactin stimulates milk synthesis. Oxytocin stimulates milk ejection. So make sure you know the difference between those two. Okay. Uh, the female reproductive system is controlled by monthly hormone cycle um, that's really under the underlying control of the hypothalamus. Also, the anterior pituitary and ovary will play a role in the release of some of these hormones. Um, we have monthly changes within the ovary and also within the uterus. We can separate these out, although they occur concurrently and kind of in a coordinated manner together. So the ovarian cycle looks at changes in the ovary during and after the maturation of the follicle or the oocyte. The uterine cycle, also known as the menstrual cycle, um, is related to the preparation of the uterus to see the fertilized egg. Um, if implantation does not occur, the functional layer of the endometrial is shed during menstruation. Okay, so hormonal regulation of the menstrual cycle. Uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone is secreted by the hypothalamus and this controls the re female reproductive system. Same hormone that we saw within the male reproductive system as well. Um, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are going to target the ovaries and drive the ovarian cycle. Um, so again, generally within a monthly basis, this will cause changes within the ovary. And then estrogens and progesterone from the ovaries drive the uterine cycle, which is our monthly changes within the uterus as well. Okay. 
So let's have a look at the ovarian cycle. We have a follicular phase and then followed by ovulation. Um, follicular phase, we're developing the follicle, essentially is what that means. So follicle stimulating hormone is released from the anterior pituitary. This stimulates the growth of the follicle. Um, eventually the follicle will grow into a graphene follicle or the mature follicle. Um, granulosa cells of the follicle will secrete estrogen and inhibin, as we previously mentioned. This increases levels of estrogen and, and inhibin um, that will actually inhibit follicle stimulating hormone. Um, increasing estrogen levels also stimulate the secretion of luteinizing hormone. Um, ovulation occurs when this graphene follicle is released into the fallopian tube. Um, luteinizing hormone actually stimulates the release of this. And then lastly, we have the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. And after um, luteinizing hormone stimulates the release of the egg in order for ovulation to occur, it also stimulates the development of the corpus luteum from ovulated or ruptured follicle. The corpus luteum will also secrete um, mostly progesterone and some estrogens as well. And again, this will occur as that egg moves through the fallopian tube during the ovulation process and then also afterwards as we head towards uh, menstruation. Progesterone is going to help to prepare the endometrium for possible pregnancy. So again, helping to build up that endometrial wall with those capillary beds and also with that carbohydrate layer. So again, here you can see the relationship between estrogen and progesterone in terms of the development of the follicle, the release of the follicle for ovulation, and then the corpus luteum and eventually the corpus albicans, which we know as the scar tissue um, left over from each ovulation. Okay, so here you can see the follicular phase, ovulation, and then the luteal phase. Okay, so let's talk about those phases of the uterine cycle. Again, we're talking about what's going on within the uterus itself. So we have what's known as the proliferative phase. Um, this is when we have uh, rising estrogen levels from the growing follicle. Uh, this stimulates functional layer of the endometrial to be four to 10 millimeters in thickness. The secretory phase, uh, corpus luteum of ovaries secretes progesterone. As we mentioned, this progesterone will stimulate more thickening of that functional layer of the endometrial wall to 12 to 18 millimeters. Again, during the secretory phase, we have increased blood supply into the endometrial, and we also have in, a growth of endometrial glands. And then lastly, the menstrual phase or menses, we have a decrease in progesterone level that causes that functional layer of the endometrial um, to discharge, resulting in vaginal bleeding that we call menstruation. And this actually marks the beginning of the next cycle. So if you ever go to the doctor and they, or the gynecologist or anything, they always want to know what was the first day of your last menstrual cycle. And they ask you that because they consider that the beginning or the mark of your next cycle. Um, same is true with like ovulation kits or, you know, if you go to like a fertilization clinic or something along those lines, um, it's very important that they know the beginning of your menstrual cycle because again, that marks that beginning of um, the changes in hormones and that sort of stuff. So here you can see kind of a summary of um, the, the uterine cycle. So you can see the menstrual phase, um, ovulation occurring in there um, right after the proliferative phase and then the secretory phase. And you can see here the um, changes in the thickness of that endometrial wall. Okay. So this is kind of a cool summary image for you that shows you both the follicular phase, the luteal phase, ovulation, and how, how that ovarian cycle relates to the uterine or the menstrual cycle. Again, keep in mind that they work very interchangeably together. Um, we should consider them as a cycle that works very closely together because of the interrelationship of all the hormones that are going to affect um, both both cycles, essentially, the ovarian cycle and also that menstrual cycle. 
um, just a, a tidbit of information about the fertilization process. So um, if fertilization does occur, the embryo will implant on the endometrial wall, and then the female will maintain those levels of progesterone. Again, remember that the decrease in progesterone is what allows the menstrual cycle to occur. So if pregnancy occurs, we don't want to have the menstrual cycle, so we maintain high levels of progesterone for the next nine months. And this will allow um, that, that female to maintain that endometrial layer. Since the corpus luteum secretes progesterone, it must be maintained. Again, um, as we mentioned before, this would cause females that have had children to have large corpus albicans, um, depending on the number of children that they've had. Luteinizing hormone normally maintains the corpus luteum, but luteinizing hormone is inhibited by these, these high levels of progesterone. Um, and also, the outer part of the baby, essentially the blastocyst, um, secretes hormone, the hormone known as human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. And this is actually what we measure when you take a pregnancy test. We're measuring to see if this hormone is evident within your body. So when you pee on a stick during a pregnancy test, this is essentially what that test is looking for is HCG, right? That's on the quiz. So make sure you know which hormone we're testing for um, when we do a pregnancy test. So HCG takes the place of luteinizing hormone, and this will help to maintain the corpus luteum and therefore, you know, allow us to maintain that endometrial wall and create a, an environment to which this egg can continue to grow. After three to four months of pregnancy, the corpus luteum begins to de degenerate, and now the placenta of the baby will produce its own estrogen and progesterone, and it can then maintain the endometrial layer um, that way.